As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest tonight, Joel Salatin, co-founder of Polyface Farms. Our activist farmer is here with us on Reluctant Preppers to tell us about how to get the entire family engaged so you don't have to go it truly alone as a lead uh, head of your family in getting your family for preparedness. Joel, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Dunnigan. It's great to be with you again. Now, you give a talk on your circuit called How to Work with Your Kids so Your Kids Will Work With You, and you talk about generational farming and really collaborating as a family. A uh, number of people who are head of household and kind of leading the the family, sometimes the multi-generational family in preparedness, even concerns, even being willing to think about or talk about, let alone raise a finger to do anything about uh, working from a life of you know, first world sort of dependency to independent living, uh, would really like to know how to keep uh, the family on the same page so we're all uh, rowing the boat the same direction so that we're not, you know, dragging our family kicking and screaming into this into this hard work that sometimes is is before us if we want to start taking better care of our, ourselves and taking care of business. So if you could tell us what are the wisdom tips that you give to people who want to know how to get your kids to work with you and how to work with them. Yeah, well, um the the, the most the, the quickest way to break down something is for there to be um disagreement between, you know, spouses. And so um, I'm a big believer in, in getting on the same page there. If, if you're not on the same page there, you're never, get on, you're never going to get on the same page, um, it, you know, with, with, the, with the children. And so, so the, um, you know, the, the, the singleness of mission statement, uh, you know, what are, what are we wanting to do? What's our, you know, what, what are we really after here? Um, you have to be on the same page, and that includes, by the way, dealing with all of the um, all the little thorny things like like uh, one, one is a starter and one's a finisher. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, you know if you're a, if you're a starter, you have a lot of unfinished uh, projects around, and if you're a finisher, all those unfinished projects drive you crazy, um, and just make it look like everything's cluttered. And so, um, you know, there has to be some has to be some compromises and some understanding there. Um, but but anyway, the, the the idea here is that you and your significant other, you've got to get on the same page as far as what you want to do, um, and and what what projects are the most important to do. And then, the the amazing thing about kids is that they they love. They generally get drawn magnetically and and inherently to things that mom and dad are passionate about. I mean that's that's just uh, that's just family function 101. You know, I'm, and, I'm thinking and, of the scene where I was standing on a ladder with a circular saw, cutting the header of my garage door higher and reinforcing it so we could get our new bought conversion van to fit into the too small of a garage door, and my three year old son come walking on the driveway saying. Daddy, I want to use a big saw. And I say, ah, it's really, really hard. It's really dangerous. I want to do the hard job. He said so. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, they are drawn uh, naturally to wanting to do what excites us, what floats our boat, what what they see us doing. Uh, for them to not be interested in it is aberrant. Uh, not not that your kids are always going to follow in your footsteps or or anything like that, but but. Something isn't quite right when um, you know when the kids uh, don't want to be drawn to it. Now, um, so several you know, uh, little ways that you can make that happen. Um, you know, just besides being you know being excited about it, is to make the different projects and the different jobs. Um, uh, competitive in nature, where there's where you turn into games instead of chores, and um, so you know one way is is instead of um, uh, you know go out and 
pick beans, well, let's let's make a let, let's put a piece of pink survey tape from you know this bean plant to that bean plant, and then from and then another row from this bean plant to that bean plant, and of course you know you're you, obviously along with this is all uh, age specific. I mean, obviously, if I'm the parent and I'm going to pick beans, I'm going to make my distance between pink ribbons uh, farther than that's going to be for a five year old. Okay. But uh, but the point is to put your two pink ribbons on. There's a nice clear goal there, and uh, let's see who can finish first. And and so you, you turn. You, kids love games. I mean I mean kids and games go together like, you know like peanut butter and jelly. So um, so so you know turn turn that into a game, and they can look up and see their ribbon. They can see your ribbon. You know and and they can kind of see what's going along. Um, Probably one of the most significant uh, things that I think is important on this is to make task-oriented tasks and not time-oriented tasks. By that, I mean you never say, go pull weeds in the garden for 30 minutes. If you say, go pull weeds in the garden for 30 minutes, there, think about that. There's no incentive for doing a good job. There's no incentive in hurrying. There's no incentive to get done what's done. I mean, you have to put in your time. So if I do five feet in 30 minutes, uh, I get no more incentive, you know, anything than if I do, you know, 10 feet in 30 minutes. Yeah, it shuts off all the creativity to come up with methods sure. and, and approaches that are going to be more efficient, efficient too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we do the same thing with, like, you know, go practice the piano for 30 minutes. Um, we, we, we do this, this time-oriented stuff all the time. And um, so what we need to do is, is make it task-oriented, where there is an incentive for completion. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, where, where you incentivize completion um, and, and, and efficiency, obviously. So, so the, the reward for, you know, go out and weed the green beans. I guess I'm stuck on green beans tonight. Um, weed the beans from here to there. And if it takes you 10 minutes, great. If it takes you an hour, that's fine. But you've got to weed them from here to here. And when you get done... <laughs> The reward is not, oh, you finished early, go weed some more. <laughs> that's, that's not the reward. Uh, the reward is something that's, that's tangible. It could, be, it could be, you know, money. It could be uh, time, like reading a story. It could be recreation. We'll go fishing or go for a swim or, you know, um, food. I mean, it, it could be any number of, re- of proper, you know, rewards. But the point is that you reward completion. I got to tell you a story about this. Um, early on in the early years, uh, Daniel was, I don't know what, three years old, you know, and uh, he would go out with me. And in those days, we didn't have a post drive or anything and, and, uh, to, to build fence. And we were, <clears throat> I remember one spring we were building a, a new, a, a replacing a piece of boundary fence with the neighbor. And, um, so I was going up every morning and and uh, trying to get in, you know, about 15 or 20 uh, posts in 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 the, in the morning. And um, so Daniel would go with me, and he'd bring his little, you know, Tonka trucks and stuff, and he'd play there in the dirt, and and I'd I'd uh, work along. Well, one of the ways that I push myself in such a situation is say, well, I'm not going to stop for a drink of water until. You know, I do two more posts or, or one more or whatever. You know, so you, 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 you deny yourself a little bit of uh, gratification, and it kind of stimulates you to, to get done so you can get your drink of water. So we're, you know, we're going along, and, of course, as a three-year-old is wont to do, you know, he starts to whine, oh, I'm, you know, Daddy, I'm thirsty. No, Daniel, we can't, we can't stop. We can't have a drink of water. I'm not going to get a drink until I finish. Do I don't do that next post. And uh, so anyway, so he kind of grew up this way. So long about uh, you know nine years old. What are all nine year old boys need? They need to go out and build a fort, right? They got to go out and build a fort. We had a neighbor boy here, the same age, in the neighborhood, and uh, the two boys got together and they decided they had to go build a fort. 
So they were going to build it at the neighbor's place. And uh, so the appointed day came, we're going to build the fort. And so, you know, Daniel left in the morning and went over to the neighbor's place. And about an hour and a half later, the neighbor, the mother called of the neighbor boy. The mother called. She says, what is it with your son? He won't let my son have a drink of water until they finish that east wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. But, you know, you know, they say more is caught than caught than taught. And, and I remember well um, our daughter, uh, Rachel, when she was about 10, uh, she and a couple little uh, girlfriends uh, started a little, a little newsletter, you know, uh, uh, with, with subscriptions of about, you know, five people. And, uh, and um, it came around for Thanksgiving. Well, you know, so everybody had to write a little piece, you know, what are you thankful for? And, and, and you know what her piece was? I mean, she was like, I don't know, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12 years old. Her piece was, I'm thankful for work. Because think of the chaos and confusion our world would have if it weren't for work. And, uh, I, you know, um, our kids aren't perfect. Our kids aren't perfect. But I'll tell you what, both of them have an incredible work ethic. And I think, I think a lot of it is because Teresa and I, we, we're hard workers, and we work efficiently, and we appreciate work well done. And, and, um, and doing some of these principles where it was always task-oriented, never time-oriented, it, it taught our kids, Hey, you know, you work hard and you can get done early. Then you can look back at what you did, and you can or you can go read a book. You can be done early. The whole idea here is is you know efficiency. Think think how we can get this done quickly. Stay with it. Don't take a nap. Don't go lollygagging. You know, stay with it and get it done early. And uh, and and that right there, that one principle, can make huge differences in in the. You know, in the work ethic and just the, you know, the spirit, the, the spirit and attitude with which kids look at work. What about the size of the task? If it seems overwhelming, how do you how do you break it down so that people feel like I can really accomplish this? They can they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, well, of course, you know, how, you know the old song about how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. And so, <clears throat> so there's where you you make you make lists. You you break it down. Um, you might have this great big goal up here, but you make you make all the little pieces part of a list. Teresa and I are both list makers. She's a lot better list maker than I am, even. And um, and and our kids are list makers, especially our daughter. And uh, boy, I mean, she's got post-it notes and lists all over the place. And 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 Teresa, my wife, is such a great list maker that if she gets to the end of the day and she had to do something that wasn't on the list. She puts it on the list so she can cross it off. <laughs> and, I do that too. And, yeah. And, and so, so when you have a big project, a, a big thing, you don't put down the big project. You, you, might, you might create that as a heading. But, you know, think about like United Way goals or a, a church building project or any kind of fundraising thing. You know how they make the – how they'll, they'll have the, you know, the goal up here at the top of a thermometer, you know, and then they gradually ink in the increments uh, going up to it. And, uh, and you have to, you know, you have to see, you have to have something to mark off. You have to have completion points. This is the whole point of uh, Dave Ramsey's um, uh, debt snowball. You know, uh, if you're familiar with Dave Ramsey. Yes, sir. Um, um, you know, he, he says, don't start with the biggest debt. Start with the smallest one. You list all your debts. Start with your smallest one. Why? Because satisfaction encourages you know, it incentivizes more action, and so so complete when you can when you can mark one off, that incentivizes the completion. So if you're going to build a if you're going to build a solarium on the side of the house, you know don't don't have a, a don't just say well, we're going to build a solarium on the side of the house. Well, you can say that, but then then what you want is a, is a list. All right, um, we're going to first of all number one is agree on the dimensions. All right. Um, number two, agree on the materials. All right? I mean, this is all just planning stuff, but you actually mark off and, and, and you come to agreement on those kinds of those kinds of things. And the discussion, the build up, the, the, the you know the, the the planning and build up to this thing. I mean, kids, even very small kids, can just I mean, can be, get, get sucked into something like this 
when uh, this kind of discussion involves them. And that's another one of my principles is that, is that I, I think that we don't expect much from our kids. And, um, and, and, I mean, when you think about historically, I mean, the bar mitzvah was at 12. That's when a Jewish boy becomes a man, uh, 12-year-old. You know, how many people with 12-year-olds could trust them to, you know, to be a man? Um, uh, you know, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody um, was on the Pony Express when he was 13. He was 13, ran the Pony Express. When he was a 13-year-old carrying a, carrying a, a, a pistol, a Colt revolver, uh, U.S. mail through hostile, you know, Indian territory on a horse, 13 years old. I mean, think about the judgment, the skill, the goodness gracious, uh, all, a 13-year-old. And, and, and so we, you know, we have, we have deprived our children from really meaningful, visceral interactions with the adult world. We, we, we call that child abuse, you know, or, or child exploitation when, when kids uh, work. Um, and, and in my book, you know, Folks, This Ain't Normal, I, the whole first chapter, I start out with the, with the abnormality of a society where kids don't have chores. I mean, think about the chores that kids used to have, you know, fill the wood box, uh, draw water, have, have water for mama, you know, at the, at the wood stove, uh, milk the cow, um, obviously plant garden. Um, the old timers around here tell me that, that two of the, of the earliest chores for, for boys was, uh, first of all, in the winter to trap a raccoon or a possum or a skunk or something, squirrel, to trap it and take it to the chicken yard and take their knife and slit up its stomach so the chickens could have fresh animal protein in the wintertime when there weren't bugs and crickets around. It, it kept the chickens healthy and, and kept them laying eggs. And that was a one-day-a-week a one thing. One day a week, you know, the, the boy was responsible for getting something trapped and into the house. The other one, the other one was to go out in the barnyard with a wheelbarrow and pick up the cow pies that the cows dropped in the barnyard and wheel it into the barn and, and straw it down with straw so you'd have, you know, uh, good deep bedding with, with fertilizer so that those cow pies outside didn't just, you know, get leached away in the winter rain and, and, and lose them because that was important fertility. Um, but, you know, these, these, were all, these were all chores. You read these 1900 books, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of things that the children did. And... Um, and you know, very, very powerful. I mean, the idea that a child is a liability today, you know, we, we see statistics, how much it costs, you know, how, what a child costs. Well, it's, it's a crazy economy if children are a cost to the household. Children should be an asset to the household. And if, if your household is operating so that children are a cost, a, a liability, a cost, liability, an expense to the household, then the household needs to flip around a little bit and be creative enough so that these children can be an asset to the household. Yeah, ironically, and, you, you talked in the past about how some of the things that we're doing are the, are creating the illness, and we need to be the own, our own remedy for the illness. And this is a good example. People talk about the, oh, children these days aren't don't know responsibility, and they expect to be and they so entitled, and we're, and it's like, but we're we're reaping the fruits that we from the seeds that we sow there, and, and you have to start sowing different seeds. What are you saying? Well, yeah, responsibility is like a muscle, and if if you don't exercise that muscle, you're not going to have any responsibility. And so if we, you know, if, if we expect nothing from the kids, you know, all all we expect them to do is sit on a sit on a uh, an iPhone in the back seat and play uh, games. Um, you know that's that's not going to be. Th then we wonder, you know, why they don't fail when when we're when we're when they become adult uh, in size, and and they don't fail. They fail to you know fail to launch. Um, why? Because you know they've not exercised that responsibility muscle for good decision making, which brings me to another point, and that is. We are big believers in child entrepreneurship, and um, I, I speak um, routinely at the Home Educators Association of Virginia, HEVE, 
and I do one of these uh, one of these seminars that we're discussing right now. I do one on on child entrepreneurship, and uh, one of the funnest parts of that seminar every time I do it is I just ask for for just quick you know popcorn, send it back to me, um, people to belt out think uh, uh, entrepreneurial things that kids under 16 are doing okay and it it's unbelievable it's unbelievable from from pet sitting to um you know to of course you know the old the old standby you know lawn mowing snow shoveling but um uh you you would be amazed you'd be amazed at the at the entrepreneurial things that young people do so i know for me I started my first chickens when I was 10 years old, and so I, and so here's the thing. When I say child entrepreneur, I mean child entrepreneur. It's not mom and dad uh, vicariously reliving something that they didn't get to do. We're talking about autonomous childhood things. Now, that doesn't mean that, that you have no oversight over your 10-year-old. Um, what it does mean is that you have very, very limited oversight, and so they have to sink and swim. You're not, you're not going to sit here and say, you better go out and take care of your chickens or they're going to die. No. When those chickens become sick and die, that will be a really important lesson for you. Um, and when they, when they cease to be profitable, that will be a really important lesson for you. You'll find out that profits don't just grow on trees. And, uh, and so, so at 10... Um, Dad, in his wisdom, allowed me to, you know, to do this chicken business. And when somebody came and, you know, a relative or a friend or somebody from church or whatever, hey, you know, I want to see your chickens. Dad would say, well, they're not mine. They're, they're Joel's. You know, he's, he's a guru. And so I'd, you know, I'd take them around and show them my chickens. Um, and, and so when, when our kids came along, uh, Daniel started his rabbits when he was eight. And that was his business. And all through, you know, uh, growing up, he, he had his business. When people come and they're interested in the rabbits, I don't know anything about rabbits. You know, Daniel's the, the rabbit guru. And he's become actually actually a, a national uh, um, leader on pastured rabbits now. And, uh, and, and you know, has self-breeding stock and um, has quite a following, you know, with, with people asking questions and things. So he, it, uh, and, and what that does is it gives... It gives incredible self-affirmation. You know, at the end of the day, what it does to a child, and I, I, when I say child, I mean anywhere from, you know, 6 to, to 15, uh, 16. What it does to a child to have, to, to self-actualize as the boss of something, as the, uh, as the king of something, as the CEO of something, um, is is so much more powerful than being the top points getter on Angry Birds, um, it, because you know how to you know how to do something, and or you know how to make something, you know how to uh, fix something, and so so there's all so many wonderful principles that come through with being in business for yourself, and uh, and, and whether you're in an urban setting or a rural setting. There are there are tons and tons and tons of opportunity out there uh, for for being in business. Um, when Rachel came along, she started making these little uh, uh, hand woven uh, pot holders, you know, on these little elastic loom things. Sure. And sure. and uh, you know the material cost about twenty five cents a little pot holder. She sold them for two. Well, you know, a little six seven year old cherubic who. Who cannot say yes? I'll buy five of them, you know, and uh, and so you know, she she was real artistic, and so she put these beautiful color schemes together, and uh, had quite a thriving business. And then she started making uh, pound cakes and zucchini bread, and and uh, boy, I remember one day at, at farmers market, I was standing there, she was with me, she was probably I don't know ten maybe, and this lady came by, and she just. Made all over Rachel. Oh, are you the one? Because Rachel hadn't been there the previous week when the lady had bought one of her zucchini bread, and uh, she served it at her garden club, you know, that week. And then here Rachel was at farmers market. The lady came out. Oh, are you the lady, the girl that made the, the lady that made the, you know, zucchini bread? The lady, you know, Rachel's ten. 
um, zucchini bread for the garden club. I said, it's the best zucchini bread they've ever had, blah, 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 blah. You know, that, that's, real, that's real stuff. That, I mean, that is, that is real stuff. And what that does to the psyche, to the encouragement, to the whatever, to the, to the, you know, the self-awareness and affirmation of, a, of, a, of, of anybody, I mean, adults thrive on that, uh, um, let alone kids. And so that kind of direct, direct, purposeful and needful interaction with the adult world is priceless for kids. Um, you know, we, we too often we, you know, we 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 don't make a platform. We don't purposely make a platform in which those kids can interact meaningfully with adults, but it's that adult world interaction, meaningful interaction, not make work, not silly stuff, not sideshow, but true meaningful interaction that really fires up, you know, a, a, a child. And so, so uh, you know, both of our kids, when they were 20 years old, had $20,000 in the bank, and we never gave, we never gave a... Um, what do you call it? Uh, allowance. Allowance. Well, yeah, we 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 don't believe in allowances. Nobody should get an allowance. No, nobody should get paid for breathing. You know, um, and and by the same token, there are things I think that you should get paid for. Um, you should not get paid for, like like you know, cleaning up your room, putting your dirty clothes in the laundry. Um, you know, those are things. Those are things that you do because you're part of the. You know, the household, part of the family, part of the function. And, and there again, you know, getting paid for everything or, or getting little, you know, stars for everything, um, I think can sometimes um, create a, an entitlement idea that, that everything I do should be compensated. Well, you and I know as adults, there are a lot of things we do that don't get compensation, like, you know, cleaning the toilet. Uh, running the vacuum cleaner, you know, we don't get paid for that, but we do it because it's part of the necessary functioning of of, of humanity, and um, and I think that there's a strength in separating in, in 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 requiring things to be done because this is what it takes for the household to run smoothly, and then here's your fiefdom, here's your your autonomous deal, and you know, and and it's it's your compensation now. Um, when the kids had their businesses and earned their and they were earning their money, um, of course, you know, Teresa and I were good, you know, bankers for them if they needed a loan or whatever. And then as they became profitable and successful, then you know, in their teens and had all this money in the bank, then Teresa and I could borrow money from them for the farm, you know, when we needed it. <laughs> it kind of, kind of worked out that way. Um, but but it's their money. It's their money. And um, and and. Sometimes they spend it on things we thought were, was frivolous. Uh, well, that's okay. That's good. Do your frivolous spending when you're young and don't have a lot of uh, 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 responsibilities. You know, how many people hit married life and they're still spending frivolously? Um, get that out of your system when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and find out that things things don't satisfy and, uh, and, and, and keeping up with the Joneses is 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 a pretty tough roto and get that out of your system early so that when you hit adulthood you're you know you have again you have a, a, a more exercised well-rounded eclectic um, decision-making model so so um, parents um, you know think about different projects different things that can be done and then and then let those be entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial things. You'd be amazed what happens when the family flock of chickens becomes, you know, uh, becomes Jill's. Uh, and, and Jill is, you know, 10 years old, and that becomes her chickens. And instead of the family rabbitry, um, those become Michael's rabbits, okay? And um, and that that patch of garden right there, you know, if you will grow that ten by ten square, um, 
here's what we'll pay per pound for you know green beans, beets, carrots, and suddenly um, those kids, instead of doing chores or doing um, you know mom and dad's whatever uh, stuff, it becomes theirs. They have ownership. They become stakeholders, and they rise or fall you know on their own measure, uh, on their own uh, diligence and and perseverance. That's a brilliant. Uh, I, I never connected the dots there. I've been a real proponent of employee ownership. Uh, you know, uh, you never had to get the pirates uh, motivated to work hard or to take on risks or whatever because they knew that they had a full stake in the outcome of the venture. And uh, yes. companies that make sure that they're you know, that the people that all the people that work there are are part owners of the company. They don't have to sit there and have pep rallies to get people motivated for this latest campaign or this project because they all know that the the betterment of their situation is is intrinsically and inherently organically part of their motivation. Just flows naturally to that. We're, we're wired for that. But I never thought about that in this regard. If you want the kids to to you know go out and pick the garden or whatever, we didn't make it their garden and buy the stuff off of them. I never. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, and, and the same is true for you know for for other projects. I mean, um, uh, for example, uh, our, I told you our daughter is very artistic, so um, you know, so we've had her uh, you know design things, do things. Um, we we pay her for that. Okay, uh, she's real gifted at it, and and, and you pay. Uh, it, maybe you have a maybe you have a child that's really you know a geek. Okay, well, um, uh, maybe maybe uh, you maybe you're trying to um, uh, maybe you're trying to go. Let's just let's just say you're trying to go off grid. Okay, and so and so, what's that worth to you? What what would it be worth to you to go off grid? Would it be worth uh, two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars? Okay. Well, tell that 16-year-old geek son or daughter, you research it, you come up with the best option, give us the alternatives and the why, and when the project is installed, you're going to get, we'll pay you $2,000 to sleuth it, figure it out, and decide the best alternative for us when it's installed, you know, we pay you for all of your sleuthing and design work. I mean, that that suddenly becomes a because many parents uh, are. I mean, I've got all sorts of things around here that I would like to do, but I'm not going to live long enough to do them. And so, incentivizing, incentivizing, especially as kids get older, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Man, you know, researching stuff on the internet, making calls, you know, being the, 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 you know, call it a, make your family into a business, even if it's, you know, just something for fun. You know, the XYZ, I'm calling on behalf of the XYZ uh, business here in Chattanooga, and we're looking at, you know, and, and let them run with it. I mean, the drama, the, uh, the, the, the personal satisfaction, uh, it's, it's just really powerful. Um, Another another element here that I would be remiss if I didn't come in at, at this point and say this all sounds wonderful, but I can hear I can hear the parents in the background saying, "Yeah, but what if they mess up?" I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I kind of saw the <laughs> electric arcs happening during the off grid uh, solar installation there. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't say there isn't any oversight, but I, but I am saying, you know. Release them, release them, and uh, and incentivize them. And so, um, you know, what about these bent over nails? What about these, you know, boards that are cut crooked or, or whatever? And um, and all I can say there is you have to get over it. Um, and I can be very, very personal on this. My dad, my dad was a journeyman pattern maker in at Delco Remy, which was a subcontractor to uh, Chevrolet um, back, you know, in before World War II, um, and and that was in the day when they actually made wooden patterns to pour like carburetor molds into and engine molds. They they would make these. 
these wooden molds, and then they would pour the they would pour the castings in, and then that 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 lead casting became the the, the, the template. Then for the then they'd pour thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And um, so, you know, if you think about making if you think about making a wooden carburetor, um, talk about exacting specifications. And um, so, so what I'm getting at is, Dad was a master woodworker. He he could build furniture. He could build tables. Grandfather clocks. He built our cribs for us us kids. We still have it. It's the, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Um, uh, he, he could build anything. I, on the other hand, am totally function. You know, if it works, I don't care what it looks like. I've always told Teresa, you know, I'd love to build a house, but you wouldn't want to live in the house that I built. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all these ideas, you know, for underground and, and, and putting the toilet on top of a biogas chamber, you know, all this stuff. But but it, it, it would be a completely, it would be an amazing house, but it would not be pretty. You know, it, it would be it would be more like a barn, you know, kind of a, a, a people barn. <laughs> and, and yet, and yet, with this, you know disparity between father son i can i can never remember him uh making fun complaining uh or being short i mean some of the first things you know, on a farm what are some of the first things you do well you build you know you build a gate you know for the corral or or, or you know, something like that and uh, of course i built these chicken shelters you know i started with my chickens and i was building these chicken shelters you know when i was uh 12 and 13 years old and um, and I, I could never cut a ninety degree angle. I mean, I couldn't make a saw cut. I mean, this was before this was before circle saws. You know, all you had was a carpenter saw. I couldn't make that saw cut straight. Everything was you know crooked. Gates were you know hung uh, you know three shades to the wind, but they swung. They swung and they worked. And you know what? The cows never complained. Maybe that's one reason why I like animals so much. Um, you know, if you look at our barn roof, you know, it, it looks like the waves of the ocean, you know. Um, and, and uh, well, partly it's because, you know, we, we use pole, pole rafters instead of, you know, dressed uh, rafters from Lowe's because we're, do we're doing it yourself. But, you know what, I've never had a cow, a pig, a chicken. I've never had an animal complain about my carpentry. I've never had them complain about my 87-degree angles. Never had them complain about anything. And you know what, Dad didn't either. Dad didn't either. And I run into many, many, many adults. When I go down this road, you'll see a 50-year-old, you know, big old burly man. Tears start trickling down his cheeks. Because you know what? All he remembers all his life is he was never good enough. Being corrected, being good corrected, good yeah. Yep, never good enough. And so, so um, one of my big points is, is praise, praise, praise. You know, uh, Stephen Covey in his classic uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he, he talks about um, uh, emotional equity being a gas tank. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. He says every one of us is, we have a gas tank with our spouse, our kids, our coworkers, our friends. We have this, this emotional gas tank with them. And, and we're, either putting, we're either putting gas in or we're making, we're pulling gas out and you have to have enough emotional equity gas in other people's tank that you can make an occasional withdrawal because you know what you and I are human and we're going to say we're going to say an unfit word an unkind word um, uh, an incorrect word uh, we're going to have a wrong perception sometimes of something we're going to jump to a conclusion we're human you know we're going to we're going to make a mistake and we're going to make a withdrawal and of course, you know the the most critical withdrawal, of course, is the one with your spouse or with your kids, right? And you've got to have enough equity in that tank that you can make a withdrawal occasionally without shipwrecking the you know the relationship. And and so um, so if you have praised your kids enough and not been a complainer, a whiner, a, 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 you know, good enough is perfect. Good enough is perfect. It is perfect. Good enough is perfect. Um, 
and and if you've been an encourager like that, um, you can make a correction every now and then, and make that emotional withdrawal, uh, and and still be fine and and get along well. But if but if all the child hears is correction, 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 and no praise when it's done well, you'll never get enough equity in that gas tank to make a withdrawal. Well, Joel, is, uh, before we let you go, is there any other uh, major topic that we've left unturned in this idea of, of how you get the, your, your family and your children engaged with you on these uh, otherwise onerous preparedness tasks? <laughs> well, I'd say the, o- the only other thing maybe that we, didn't, that we didn't touch as hard as I'd like to touch it uh, is just <laughs> bring your kids into your world. Um, I think so many times we assume we assume that the kids aren't interested in our world, that we that we just let them be in their world. We 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 don't we don't go out of our way to involve them in our world. And the truth is that kids have great ideas because you know what they haven't done it this way all their life. And I know that that. As, as we started here with the farm and as, as, as our kids got a little older, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, it, it was absolutely um, epiphanal. You wouldn't believe the number of good ideas that the kids had um, about, what we, about things, about the business, about the farm, about what we should do. When, you know, Teresa and I are wrestling over something, and from the mouth of babes comes you know, this, this tremendous observation, this truth, and you go, you know, oh, you know, why didn't I think of that? And, and it, it's very, very powerful. And I, I think that, that we as parents, if, if there's one thing that we kind of universally, um, um, you know, lack, uh, I would say good parents. Um, and we all know parents that don't give a care about their kids and the, the parents are off on crack. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, good families. Uh, functional families. If, if, if I think if there's one thing as as universal as anything, it is that 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 we don't we don't assume early enough that the kids have a significant contribution. And I think that's a big mistake. That's a big mistake. And we need to. Uh, it, it, it's better to bring the kids in on the discussions and the planning and the working it out earlier. Than later, uh, we see this. We see this routinely. For example, butchering chickens. I'll just I'll just move there for a moment. Um, we've actually taken some heat out there, you know, in the world um, with people. You, know, you shouldn't allow eight-year-olds to see uh, chicken processing. You know, dead chickens, whatever. You know, slicing throats and blood and guts and all that stuff. And what we have found. For, and we've been at this decades, what we have found is that up until about 10 or 11 years old, we have never seen a child flinch from that. It, it's just, it, they, you know, they just, they just participate in it. They get into it, and it, it, just, it just is. At Mother Earth News Fairs, uh, you know, there for three or four years, Dave Schaefer and I did this, you know, chicken evisceration thing, and 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 uh, and we we would actually get the kids up on stage with us and and let them pull heads and clap for them when they got the head pulled off and stuff and and little kids love this but if you don't get them at that point by the time they're about twelve something happens eleven twelve thirteen something happens that 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 child uh, whatever uh, you know mystique. Uh, just, just you know, curiosity and and openness, it starts it starts to close in. It starts to become calloused, and they start to be concerned about what they look like and what other what their friends are saying and, and all this stuff, and um, and and you know what the Kardashians would do and, and that sort of thing, and and suddenly you you've lost them. And so I'm just that, that's one reason why I'm such a huge believer in child gardens. You know, out there at, at, at five, six, and I mean, well, in diapers, you know, they should be out there with you. Now they can't do a lot, but they should they should be out there with you. Um, don't shelter them. 
uh, involve them as adults. Don't talk to them like don't sit there and jabber jabber and blah, 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 blah. talk. Use use words. You know, use uh, one of the funnest ones was Daniel. One time we got up from Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, and Daniel pushes back from the table. He says, "Oh, I think I, I think I overindulged." <laughs> <laughs> it was the wrong word, uh, overindulged. But but the point was, you know, at, at at six years old, he knew the word. You know, he knew this, and and we always talked to the kids like they were adults. You know, um, and 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 assumed assumed that they were part and parcel of our world. I won't belabor it more, but you see what I'm getting at. And and I think I think that 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 the most common mistake in good families is that we just we just assume. Well, it's my world and their world, and they're not interested in my world. And, and the fact is, they are fascinated by our world. And the sooner we draw them into it, make them a part of it, let them participate in it, the more they'll start exercising those responsibility muscles, those dependability muscles, and 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 they'll they'll become the the, the best the best sidekick we could ever have. That's an awesome uh, send off for us, uh, Joel. Thank you so much. It, it reminded me as you talked about that whole last section about uh, the some of the virtues of uh, not just homeschooling, which is a, a perfect opportunity, but anytime you can work shoulder to shoulder with your kids and let them get involved in your things. And you talked about that early early start because the world. Uh, people worry about socialization, but a lot of the socialization that's out there, if it's unchecked, can kind of dumb them down and get them more worried about peer pressure and everything and loss of confidence in themselves rather than their natural. Kids are naturally curious, naturally confident, naturally wanting to do accomplish things. So, you know, catch them while, while that spark is still alive and fan that uh, into an ember of a flame. So, Joel, thank you so much again for joining us on Reluctant Preppers and talking with us about how to get your children engaged and willingly work with you on uh, preparedness. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to be with you.